At the turn of the last century, there were two main companies that dominated the automotive industry in the United States. Everyone is familiar with the heritage of the Ford Motor Company, with their first cars appearing as early as 1903. However, it is much less known that Buick also got their start at the same time in 1903, and also in Detroit, Michigan. However, the company was later moved to Flint, Michigan. Buick is also the company that founded General Motors in 1908. So while Ford is well known for their introduction of the assembly line, Buick is just as important in the founding of the automotive industry in America. Here at Ferraris Online, we normally deal in slightly more modern European exotics. However, we get a wide array of cars that come through our doors. And when I found out this car was coming in, I was super excited because I love these brass era cars. They're just so unique. Plus, I personally have a 1930 BMW. So when this 1912 Buick came in, I was just really excited to do a video to show you guys all the unique little features about it. It's a 1912 Buick, it's a model 34 Roadster, and it has about 23 horsepower and a top speed of maybe 30 miles an hour. And I can tell you from experience, 30 miles an hour is pretty terrifying in one of these cars. So this one, I haven't driven long distances, uh, but my 1930 BMW I've taken on very long drives. We drove it for the uh, Tour de Elegance in Pe Pebble Beach, which is like 70 miles. And it just kind of bounces in the lane. Um, it doesn't want to stay in place. The brakes hardly work worth a darn. So 30 miles an hour, you're really kind of working it and pushing it. And that's about as fast as I would want to go in one of these things. These were, there were about 1400 of this car made the 34 roadsters and when they were sold new they were about $900 which seems astronomically cheap right now but if you think about it back then you can buy a nice house for like 500 bucks back in 1912 so these cars were sold basically only to the elite and the super rich Ford which was around at the same time was more of a uh, modern, uh, uh, everyone's car, you know, everyone could, not everyone, but a lot more people could afford it. Whereas the Buick was made to be much, much more luxurious and kind of for the high class, super wealthy people. So this car has so many unique features. And one of them, the most obvious you can see right away, it's right hand drive. So a bit different than American cars are never right-hand drive. But now, you know, back then in 1912, they had no um, set rules for how to make cars. So they kind of were experimenting. And another thing they were experimenting with was the pedal configuration. So if you think of it back then, there was no standard, you know, gas, brake, clutch. It was kind of figure it out and see what works best. So on this car, there's the two pedals and then a little button underneath. And it's actually brake on the right, clutch on the left, and the little button down underneath is the gas, which is one of the reasons I haven't driven this car any far distances, because in modern days, uh, if, you know, a dog runs across the street or a car pops out in front of you or something like that, your first instinct is to slam on the brake. Well, on this car, you'd be slamming on the clutch and you wouldn't stop and you'd hit something. So um, this is one of the cars that I drive shorter distances because it's fine, you know, if, if nothing pops out in front of you, but you never want that first instinct to be to hit the the, the brake and it's not the brake. Uh, another unique thing about this car is, as you can see, uh, the shifter, e-brake, everything here is external. So this right here is the brake, the emergency brake, and then the shifter, it's a three speed. And then here you have the horn and it's just a little horn right there. Um, it also has a little 
button on the floor of the car and I'll show you guys later, but it's a bell instead of a horn. So there's kind of the get out of your way and then, you know, excuse me, I'm here kind of noises. Um, this tank right here is the acetylene gas and that is for the headlamps because back in the day, they didn't have the light bulbs and electricity like we have nowadays. So these little lamps right here have an oil well in the bottom and a wick in the middle. And you light them like you would a candle, basically. Um, but the acetylene gas is for the headlights up front. And they're the brighter headlights to actually help show your way. So they are powered by the gas because it's much brighter than these. These are more kind of like in the dark so you know I'm here while those are kind of help you see what's in front of you. Um, and we'll light them for you in a bit because they're really pretty cool. I mean, it's awesome old technology plus who doesn't like playing with fire. The interior of this car has a lot of fun things and the more I've played with it, um, the more little details just make it awesome. So uh, one of the luxurious items about this car would be the fact that the little rear window is glass. And of course, back in the day, they didn't have plexi or plastic or anything like that. But it's also a piece that is unnecessary. So the addition of the glass is one of those pure luxury items because it really doesn't help that much when you see behind you. Um, and a lot of the other older cars would either just have a cutout or nothing because the glass is expensive and it breaks and all of that. So it's just one of the little luxurious items. Uh, another interesting thing is it has suicide doors. <laughs> so the doors do open like that. And uh, it only has this left door that opens. The right door, obviously, it has the external shifter and all the stuff over here. So this door does not open. You have to get in and out on the left. Another unique little thing that when I found out about it, <laughs> I just thought it's the funniest little um, bit of 1912 technology. So the oil pressure gauge on this car is literally a little glass dome. And when you start the car and run it, the oil fills the dome. And so you can see that it has oil pressure. It's actually vis visually showing you the oil and that it's still there and it hasn't all leaked out. So uh, that's pretty fun. The temperature gauge on the car and on a lot of cars of this era, you look through the windscreen into the front on top of the radiator and where the emblems are on a lot of these cars, there's the little thermometer. So you look through there to see literally the red line of the thermometer and how hot your engine is getting. Um, oh, and I promised I'd show you guys the bell. So here on the floor to my left is the bell <laughs> and the horn's fun, but I love the bell. I mean, if I'm driving down the street, I'm gonna be hitting the bell. <laughs> The first thing you're going to notice about the engine when you take a look at it is that it has external valve springs and it's just so unique because back then uh, that that was pretty standard. Now, when you see something with external valve springs, it's like, what the heck? But uh, one of the problems with external valve springs and one of the reasons that did not last was you have to keep them lubricated. And they have little brass fillers on the top of the valve springs here that you have to fill with oil every 100 miles or so just to keep it lubricated. But if you can imagine in 1912, they didn't have a lot of great paved roads. So driving over dirt, bumpy roads and stuff like that, dirt getting up in the carburetor or in the, the valve springs, it just, it was a mess. So uh, it definitely didn't stand the test of time. That went away pretty quick, but seeing this technology is a lot of fun. Uh, another thing they have is belts nowadays obviously are made of rubber. Uh, and back then the belts were leather and it's just what they had. So it's what they used, but it's just a lot of fun seeing these old cars with the leather belts and the external valve springs and the little single barrel carburetors. Uh, they're just, they're a technology you don't see anymore. So not only 
seeing them here, but seeing them still running. I mean, this car is 108 years old and it's been through two world wars, two global pandemics, uh, just it's seen a lot of history. So the fact that it's still here and it's still running and it actually runs really well. It For a car with no synchros, it shifts fine. It starts up with no issue technically i mean you know it's hard to start but it does start easily for what it is uh and it's just a wonderful piece of history so starting the car is a little bit of an ordeal compared to modern cars um first thing you want to do is make sure you're not in gear and it's probably just a safe bet to set your emergency brake because uh, if the car is in gear and you try and crank it over it can kick back and that's just all bad. Uh, these cars do not have electric starters or keys or anything like that so what you the first my 1930 BMW does have a little electric starter which makes it really easy and even though they're only 18 years apart, the um, technology has changed a lot between this car and my 1930 BMW. This one, no electric starter. You have to come over here and there's a little ignition box. And so you flip the switch on the ignition box. Then you come over here to the carburetor and there's a little valve and you turn on the gas valve. Otherwise it just leaks gas and it's a mess. Then you come over to the front and you crank it over. And one of the things you wanna make sure when cranking these cars, it is easier to crank over because you have to push in the crank and then crank it over. And for me, it's a lot easier to crank pushing down on it because I can use my weight and really get it cranked. However, that's not the way you're supposed to do it because if it were to kick back, it kicks back at you the opposite way and you can break your wrists or your arms and it's just not the best way. So when you're cranking one of the, these cars, what you want to do is crank towards you. That way, if it kicks, you're already headed that way and it's not gonna jar you so much and you're less likely to break bones. So um, it's, it's hard for me to do that because it takes a lot more strength, but it's not impossible. So it's just a good safety measure. Even if it takes a little more effort, it's the right way to do it. These headlights have to be one of my favorite parts about the car. I mean, they're fire. Like, who wouldn't want flaming headlights? So to turn these on, you go to the acetylene tank that I pointed out earlier, and you turn on the valves. And one of them is just turning on the gas. The other one is a pressure regulator to make sure that once the flame is on in here, it doesn't go back into the tube and blow up the whole tank. You turn those two on, and then back in the day, I'd imagine they'd use um, a, a, a match or something like that. Nowadays, we keep a little striker in the car um, and you just strike it and turn the headlights on. And they are actually pretty bright. Like you wouldn't expect them to be as bright as they are. Uh, a lot of it is the reflective plate on the back really shines the light out. Um, but the flames, you know, the acetylene and everything, it's really bright. So I'd imagine at night, they're nothing, obviously, compared to modern day cars, but they probably did an excellent job back in the day when there's no street lights and no surrounding light at all. So you can at least see where you're going for a few feet in front of the car. I love having the opportunity to show you guys all the different cars we get in here. Our specialty is the Enzo era Ferraris, especially kind of 60s through 80s is uh, a lot of our focus, but obviously we get all kinds of cars in here. And having something like this is just, it's an opportunity to show you a piece of history. I mean, from 23 horsepower to modern cars with modern street cars with over a thousand horsepower or from where you'd have to do a five-step process cranking the car over and actually need physical strength to start your car to nowadays where 
you can hit a button on your key fob and start your car and get the AC going so that by the time you get in your car, it's nice and cool and comfortable. Uh, technology has brought us so far and cars like this give at least me a little appreciation on the technology we have nowadays and the luxurious uh, amenities that we have, the com creature comforts uh, that just are, we take for granted sometimes. So I hope you guys have enjoyed learning all the little details about this car. And I can't wait to show you guys the next cars coming up in the next videos.